All right, I will kick off our webinar and we'll just let people come in slowly and then I'll hand it off to our STEAM professional, Nicholas. So welcome everyone. My name is Katie and uh, welcome to our health check series, Diagnosing Your Business Structure. Um, so agenda is pretty simple. I'll start off with the ground rules and introductions and then I'll pass it off, like I said, to Nicholas and he'll be uh, giving you all the information you guys came for today. Um, hopefully by the end of the presentation, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answers. Um, and that just brings me to another point. If you guys do have questions during the webinar, you should be able to find your chat box. You can type in there. Um, we'll try and answer it throughout the webinar or at the end, depending on how much time we have. Um, and just as a little thank you for attending our webinar today, we are offering 25% off our legal advice sessions. So if you guys want to make use of that, if you want to actually talk to Nicholas afterwards, a bit more detail, you can book an advice session with him. You just need to use the code September 25 in the checkout and they'll give you 25% off. Um, so like I said, just some ground rules. We just ask you guys to keep your microphones off during the presentation so you can hear us more clearly. Um, you guys should already be muted um, coming in, but if you're not, you should be able to locate your microphone and camera settings on the bottom left of your browser. Um, and like I said before, please make use of our chat. You can tell us where you're from. It kind of gives us a better idea of, you know, um, where we can take the discussion as well. And you can also pop in any questions there. My job is to be monitoring that. So I will be keeping an eye out. And then hopefully at the end, like I said, we'll have time to actually address these questions. Um, and just as a disclaimer, just a reminder, this is a presentation um, and this including any commentary or audio. This is just advice. This is not legal advice. So please, if you want full on legal advice, we recommend you book an advice session directly with Nicholas and he can give you a bit, uh, more fine tuned advice. So like I said, my name's Katie Knopp. I actually work at Goodlore as their digital marketing and sales manager. Um, I'm in charge of hosting these webinars and uh, bringing you guys new content. And then actually during the webinar, I bring all the chaos and the clarity, make sure all these questions are getting answered and everything's running smoothly. So if you guys have any questions, um, you know, for our, either Nicholas or actually in terms of good lore, you can just pop in the chat and I'll keep an eye. And without further ado, I will hand it off to Nicholas to take on the presentation. Nicholas, you're there. I am indeed here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds good on my end. I'm going to mute myself and it's all you. Perfect. So there's a lengthy sort of a LinkedIn about there about me. Doesn't really matter. I do a lot of corporate stuff, uh, published on a few things related to this content. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about all the different business structures you may have heard of, what some are good for, what some are not good for, and uh, yeah, let's just jump into it. So first thing I'm going to cover, and you'll notice the theme pretty qu quickly, is uh, all the stuff that isn't a, com a corporation. The theme being that in most cases, creating a corporation is actually the best way to run a business, but there are exceptions to that. So before I start talking about corporate structures and all that good stuff, I'm going to go over all the other ways you might end up running a business. First of all, it's the classic sole proprietorship. And it's probably the easiest one to explain. The business is you and you're the business. Uh, you can take expenses off your taxes. You can even have a business name. Typically you register it with uh, some sort of provincial entity. Service Ontario can handle that for you in Ontario. There are equivalent entities in other provinces. But if you're registering a business name, all you're really doing is paying the province a bit of money because they're doing their job and you're basically just listing an alias. So you're making it easy for people to know that Acme Plumbing or whatever is in fact, you know, Joe Smith, but you're not actually creating a separate company or anything when you register a trade name. You're just making it easy for people to know that that business is you, but it's still just you. You're the one uh, getting paid personally, you're providing the services personally, all that. And um, yeah, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it a business structure because <laughs> there really is no structure. There's just you. But that also means that uh, it doesn't scale particularly well since there's nothing built in to this lack of structure to help you scale or divide up ownership or any of the stuff you hear about when you're talking about corporate law. 
but sometimes you just don't want to have all the extra complications that come with running a corporation or any of these other things I'm going to talk about. And the main reason people uh, stick with the sole proprietorship is that there just there's not enough money coming in through that particular business to justify a whole bunch of extra administrative costs and fees. So really, if you just don't want to do much of a hassle that you're doing, eh, you're providing some kind of a service on your own. Maybe there's a few contractors coming here going to help you out. So proprietorship might be a perfectly yeah, good way to do it, start out. But if you're going to scale or if there's a lot of money coming in, if you actually need employees and there's a bunch of assets, you're probably going to want to start thinking about running it through a corporation. And for the rest of these, uh, they get really niche, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them, but you probably have heard about them at some point, so I'd like to clarify what they are. First one is a general partnership. Now, there is a bunch of different kinds of partnerships. The general partnership is almost never a good idea, but the reason it ends up getting used at all is because you can accidentally create one. Um, you don't have to like fill in a form or sign a particular contract or anything. If you just go around saying, me and my buddy are in business and you start getting into relations with other businesses, other people interacting and whenever someone's dealing with their business, it seems like they're dealing with you and your buddy. Uh, it may, you may end up in the position where you're holding yourself out as a general partnership. And what that means is it's kind of like a marriage. Basically one partner can get the entire partnership in trouble by doing something dumb and then you're both liable because you've been telling everyone oh, you're in this business together. So if one person gets in trouble, they're going to assume that the other person can also come to the aid of whatever trouble's been created. So essentially a partnership isn't actually a separate entity. It's just a partnership is a way of referring to all of the partners. So if one partner does something, that's going to affect every partner. And for all these reasons, it's not really a recommended structure structure because it's super easy to get in trouble because someone else in your little business buddy partnership did something dumb and now you're all liable. So yeah, generally not a great way to operate, but people can accidentally end up in the situation where they just start doing business amongst some people together and they don't really think about what they're doing, you can end up being on the hook for a bunch of stuff you may not have realized your buddy was like going, getting up to. So yeah, not a great way to do it, but you can accidentally end up in that situation. So you're usually better off actually taking a minute to think about, hey, how do I actually want to uh, set up this business? Uh, how, what kind of, who controls what? How are we gonna do this? And generally the, a good answer is a corporation. But before I jump into that, very quickly, some of the other things you may have heard about. Uh, limited liability partnerships are typically used when professionals can't actually form a corporation. And that happens uh, probably most notably for lawyers and accountants. We cannot offer our professional services, and there's other professionals who get stuck in this boat. Basically, we're not allowed to protect ourselves from uh, being personally liable because we're supposed to be personally liable because what we do is we're People are exposed to a lot of risk when they trust an accountant to do something or they trust a lawyer to do something. So we're not allowed to operate through a normal corporation saying, yep, the corporation's doing all this. So everything went horribly wrong. I guess that's just the corporation's fault, not mine. Or we're not allowed to do that. So one way that we still managed to get some tax benefits and at least a little bit of protection, not as much as a corporation would give you, but a little bit of being protected from your partners is a limited liability partnership. And basically that limits the ways that the other partners can get you in trouble. There are still ways they can get you in trouble, but it, there are fewer ways. Uh, but the only time you really should be looking into one of these things is if you're a professional who needs to work with a bunch of other professionals in kind of a large group giving your services out. Now, second to last of the non-corporations is a limited partnership. And I'll spend about 10 seconds on this. Basically, limited partnership or LP, Essentially, they're like corporations, but they're made specifically when someone wants the tax benefits of a bunch of losses or for some of their really niche tax reasons. So limited partnerships have a special kind of partner, which is more or less like a shareholder in a company, meaning they won't be on the hook for anything ever. It's just the partnership they'll be in trouble or the corporation, but the shareholders or the limited partners in this case. They won't ever kind of be on the hook for dumb things that the regular partners have done. However, unlike a, a uh, corporation, the limited partners get to write off on their taxes losses that the partnership incurs as if it was, as if it was their, their personal losses. 
And last but not least is a professional corporation, which is essentially a little, little version of a limited liability corporation. Basically, you see this really commonly with lawyers and accountants. They want the tax benefits of being incorporated, but they can't actually incorporate a regular company because they're not allowed to protect themselves from all personal liability. So they call themselves a professional corporation. And in that situation, the shareholders all have to be in the same profession. Typically, it's just a one lawyer. So they're the only shareholder and they just get to get a bit more creative with their taxes is essentially what happens. So that's all the other stuff you may see out and about in the world when you're learning about how someone's running their business. But now to the part that actually matters for most of us, it's the uh, actual corporate law stuff. So for most businesses that are intending to grow or that are in any way complicated, a corporation is a very handy way to do it. And probably the biggest reason you'll hear people talking about is the fact that when you make a corporation, you're actually making a separate person and you run the business through that separate sort of artificial person. And the big benefit there is that if everything goes horribly wrong, uh, worst case scenario is the corporation goes bankrupt, runs out of money, and kind of collapses under its own weight. Uh, the creditors grab whatever they can from the corporation, but you personally, so you, your house, which shouldn't be in the name of the company, and you know, all the stuff you own personally, that's not at risk. The only thing really at risk, typically, there are lots of exceptions obviously, but typically is the money you put into the corporation is all you're really at risk of losing. So you might lose that, but if the corporation ended up with a bunch of debt that goes beyond the money you put in, the creditors can't typically, can't typically come after you personally. So you're not gonna lose your house if you formed a corporation, ran a business, then I don't know, the factory burnt down, the insurance didn't cover it, etc. All of a sudden the business is on the hook for way more money than it's ever gonna be able to pay off. So that business collapses, but you personally, your money, the money you personally own, you don't lose all that. The business is gone. That doesn't look great, but you still have your house, you still have your car, you still have your savings, all that. So that's the main reason people end up creating corporations, or at least kind of the starting point. And there's tax benefits to it as well. So the corporation, corporations get taxed at a much lower rate than if you were getting money just personally. And when even when you decide to pay yourself through the corporation, even though you thought that money in question is being taxed twice, that still tends to end up being lower than if you were just um, paid yourself directly by creating the services. So taxes aren't my specialty, but I can at least tell you that much that it tends to make sense from a tax perspective if there's more than about 100,000 going to you after expenses. Uh, anything above that, you're probably better off, even just for purely tax reasons, running things through a company. So um, one thing I should mention, in order to benefit from that whole, if the company implodes, you're not in trouble thing, you do have to be running your company as a legitimate business. And what I mean by that, the best example, I also apologize if you hear my cat in the background, she has opinions, but she's not allowed in the room right now. Hey, anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> so if you're running a corporation, um, one thing that'll get you in trouble is using it as kind of a sham. Uh, an example of that would be entering into a contract as the company, knowing full well that the company definitely doesn't have the money to pay. It's one thing to believe that you're, you'll have the money to pay and you think that's reasonable and you're making contracts being like, yep, I'm gonna take on this debt because we're gonna make this money. We'll pay it off, it's fine. That's legitimate use of a corporation. You're just taking business risks. But if you make a company and then say, okay, I need this you know, these giant pile of laminate or whatever, and you know full well the company's never gonna be able to pay for that but you're just thinking, oh, I won't, I won't get in trouble because it's the company that's gonna get in trouble, not me. But you knew full well that was gonna happen. You're basically playing the company as a sham. And that's the classic case where those creditors will apply to a court. The court will look at how you're actually running your business and being, they're gonna say, okay, you created a company, but you weren't running it like it was its own separate business. You were just running it like you didn't wanna be on the hook for these things and you knew it wasn't gonna pan out. So that'll get you in trouble. And that'll destroy the whole benefit of avoiding personal liability by running a company. So that's not great. Basically, if you treat it like a business that you're actually trying to run well, then you should be able to avoid personal liability while you're running the company. So on the topic of actually running companies, now we have to talk about how that actually happens. Yep, shareholders. <laughs> so there's three major categories of person that are involved in a company. 
And one thing you have to keep in mind is it's definitely possible for any particular individual to be in all three categories. So the three categories are shareholders, directors, and officers. I'll explain what those are. And it's especially for smaller companies, it's entirely possible that there's just one person and that one person is the only shareholder, the only director, and the only officer. But as companies grow, the actual distinction between these roles becomes more important when you have people who are just shareholders or just directors. So shareholders, those are people who actually own the company. They own shares and that represents sort of intangible pieces of the company. Being, being a shareholder and owning shares never really means that you own any particular thing in the company. So like if, the, if it's a farm and you own shares in a farm, because you have 5% of the company doesn't mean that like you own that tractor over there or something. You don't actually own any assets directly with some exceptions. So if the company is collapsing and just being taken apart, then you're entitled to a share of the total value of the company that's being paid out to creditors first, but then share the shareholder, shareholders, they'll get a piece. But in the normal course of business, what shareholders are entitled to is to choose who sits on the board of directors of the company. And they're also entitled to any dividends that get they have declared by the board. And you've probably heard of what dividends are. Basically, if a company is doing it all well and it's making profits, the company board can decide to give shareholders some of those profits. So if, yeah, that's a, usually in more mature companies, you'll see that happen. Um, a bit later, I'll talk about growth companies. And with growth companies, you wouldn't actually typically pay dividends because you've become obsessed with just growing the company as quickly as possible. And if you're trying to do that, you're not typically giving shareholders their money back right away every year. But in bigger, very mature companies, there's lots kind of like investment portfolios where you're, you're buying shares just because you know that company will probably pay out a bit to their shareholders every year. And that's why you own the share. You want to get that payout. So if you're a shareholder, you and if you're a class of share, you get to choose who's on the board in, by voting your shares. And you're entitled to dividends in whatever ratio you control your shares of if the company decides to declare them. Those companies will be set up so they're not required to pay directors every year. But I mean, ultimately, the director, the shareholders decide who's on the board. So if the board isn't paying shareholders year after year, the shareholders can vote the board and choose a new board of directors who is more inclined to actually pay shareholders if that's what the shareholders have actually decided is good for the company. And um, so depending on the kind of company you're looking at, there will normally be a whole bunch of restrictions on who can buy shares and who they can show, sell their shares to. So the, uh, the major exception to this is stuff you see on a public market. So if you're buying shares through like a discount brokerage at your bank or on like Oil Simple or something like that, you're buying shares in public companies and Basically, public companies have gone through a monstrous due diligence process. It's kind of like a huge, huge audit to prove that they have a million different things cleared up in terms of all their contracts being in place, the right kinds of insurance, and a million other things. And they've satisfied a stock exchange that they're not sketchy, basically. <laughs> and they're, they're running themselves like a legitimate company. And... They have the resources in place to keep an eye on everything. And so if companies have gone to the trouble of demonstrating that, which costs millions of dollars and is a huge thing, then they're allowed to say, okay, any member of the public can buy shares in the company. And that's what you see on this stock exchange and any other major stock exchange. But I mean, a lot of companies, I say the majority, but I don't think I can pull up stats for that, tend to be private issuers, which means they aren't allowed to just sell shares to absolutely anyone. Only certain kinds of people can buy shares. Uh, now, the easiest way to get around that is to have a certain amount of money already. Uh, that means you're an accredited investor. So if you have about 250000 or more to invest in a company, you can invest in pretty much whatever private company you want. Typically, this happens in like venture capital, where someone's already kind of set themselves up to be an investor in new private companies. And the other kind of people that can get shares in a company that isn't publicly traded tend to be people who are already involved in selling with the company. So employees, uh, business partners, directors, things like that. So they have some kind of involvement in the company that gives them an insight to the company so they can't get taken advantage of is the whole idea behind 
public markets and that big million dollar auto I was talking about. So basically it's making sure that shareholders are protected from companies who might just be super fly by night and just want to get some quick cash. So they offer shares to whoever will take them, but public markets trying to protect that through audit requirements and a bunch of other stuff. So if you want to invest in a company that hasn't gone through all that, you definitely need to meet certain thresholds. So either already having a bunch of money to invest or having some connection to the company. So that's how you end up as a shareholder. And there can also be classes of shares to further complicate all that. So the most common shares, literally called common shares, uh, allow people to vote and are typically entitled to dividends. But the main thing is they're entitled to vote on who's on the board. Then you have another class of share called preferred shares that don't necessarily get to vote on who's on the board, but they get priority in terms of either getting their money back with what they invested or getting paid out if the company is bought up. So basically they get first dibs on getting the money they invested back. And they also might be entitled to dividends above what a common share is entitled to. But when you set up a company, you can actually choose what rights all kinds of different classes. You can make a million classes of shares if you were so inclined and were masochistic which all, with all kinds of weird rights. You're just required to have the right to vote and the right to receive dividends and the right to receive the assets of the company and wind up somewhere amongst the classes of shares scattered about. So as long as that's there, then you're good in terms of share classes. So that was all quite complicated. So I'll take a breath here. <laughs> so the next thing, that we'll be talking about is the board of directors. So the board of directors, they don't actually supervise the day-to-day -day operations of the company, which can be a confusing thing to think about because there are often people in a company, their title is actually director, but they are board directors, just sort of in charge of a bunch of stuff. But in terms of the actual board of directors, that is typically a much smaller group of people. And it's their job primarily is to supervise the people who are in charge of managing the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Now, directors don't typically have this as a full-time job. They usually have directors who are either independent, I'll get to what that means in a second, or you get to directors who are also amongst the officers of the company, so amongst the C-suite, and those would be executive directors. So this is where it gets kind of complicated. So if a uh, person is both a director and say the CEO or the CEO. So their job as CEO or CEO or whatever is to run the day-to-day -day of the company. But their job as a director isn't to do that. It's actually to supervise all those people who are running the day-to-day -day of the company, <laughs> which sounds very sort of strange. And that's why you ideally also have independent directors. This is assuming your company is big enough where you actually need more than one or two people keeping an eye on everything. So one thing, if you have a whole bunch of people that you want are people who are just directors or at least just directors and shareholders, which means you have people who are supervising the C-suite who aren't actually also the C-suite, which should be kind of self-evident as a good idea. You don't want people supervising a group of people who are also the same group of people. It would be a very odd situation. And that independent directors typically come up as a subject when you have investors for your company rather than just like the employees or the founders. So when you want outside money, outside money is going to typically be a lot more comfortable with your company if people are on the board who aren't also running the company day to day. And the investors are probably going to trust those directors a bit more to actually report on what's going on and ask important questions because they won't be quite as in the weeds and they won't have their own special positions and all the politics that goes on when you're running a company. They'll be divorced from that a little bit. So they'll be able to report as directors or independently than if they're also the CEO or the CEO. So yeah, a big part of being a director is reporting to shareholders on a regular basis. And last but not least, I'll talk about officers, which is what I've already mentioned a bit here. So that's basically all of your C-suite. Um, Typically the directors, the board of directors as a group will pick at least the CEO. What often happens is they'll choose the CEO and then it's the CEO's job to kind of choose all the rest of the C-suite and to report to the board about what the heck's going on with the company kind of on the ground to report to them regularly and to run everything essentially is the CEO's job. And he needs to report to the board who will keep sort of a high level overview of everything who then in turn reports to shareholders. 
And yeah, so that's the whole ecosystem for uh, how corporations are run. So like I said, if it's small, you'll often see like one person who is just doing everything. Or maybe if there's just a few people, like they'll all be shareholders and directors and officers. But the big tipping point tends to be when you start taking outside money. And then that's when you actually see the roles operating as separate roles rather than just one person doing everything. And where you really see this start to show is the difference between a small business and a growth company. Growth company is just another term for startup. So for small businesses, it's pretty common to have one or a few people who are just doing everything. They're, they own the shares, probably, maybe not equal distribution, but they all have the same kinds of shares. It might just be only one class of shares. They're probably on the board. And they probably also have some officer positions, like they're, they're, they're the CEO, they're CEO or whatever. They're all kind of doing the same thing. And it tends to be, the way to look at it is the company is just controlled by its owners, the shareholders, because the shareholders are also the directors and the officers. And what this tends to look like in terms of the legal stuff that's going on is there are usually way more protections for shareholders in terms of what can be done with the shares. So there's probably gonna be a bunch of restrictions on how and when shares can be sold. So the shareholders know they're not gonna to have to deal with some new person all of a sudden. They know that their percentage is protected and it's gonna be really hard to oust them because usually they're not expecting to need outside money or anything like that. So they're gonna to wanna to just hang on to the way things are and not wanna change. So they're gonna want a bunch of protections to keep things as it is and they'll just be happy to turn a profit and probably get some dividends paid out. And that'll be that. But for growth companies, uh, usually the whole point is to grow really, really quickly. And that means getting outside money. And what that means is that you don't typically want a bunch of restrictions on when you can bring in more shareholders or issue more shares because you want to do that. You want the company to change frequently. You want to be able to give out shares in exchange for more money, which means you don't typically want a bunch of rules in place other than the bare minimum about who can get shares because you want to be handing those things out in order to grow the company rapidly. And because of that, you are probably also not gonna be paying out shareholders frequently because the shareholders or your outside investors will more than likely want you to just put that money right back into the company because they don't wanna make a little bit of dividends every year. They wanna make like five or 10 times their investment. So they want you just to grow, 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 grow using the money they're putting in and any money you're making. So they don't wanna get paid out every year. They wanna get paid out in three or five years, just a huge amount later on. And this is what they're probably going to want independent directors so they have a better eye on what's happening without all just being one sort of clique who knows everything. So that is all the structures of shares and uh, if people have questions I'm happy you jump into stuff now because I know that was a lot of content <laughs> and if you have particular questions about how this might affect the kind of business you want to run I'm also happy to answer things through the Good Lawyer platform through the, um, the advice sessions. So yeah, I'm not seeing anything popping up on chat, but uh, yeah, Katie, if you see anything or if anyone wants to jump in, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, we can all go grab a late lunch. <laughs> awesome. Oh, it looks like there's a question from Thomas. Pros and cons on holding company structure. Sure. So yeah, uh, holding companies tend to be yeah, it's like kind of that limited partnership I was talking about. Um, it tends to be this weird Russian nesting doll for tax purposes. <laughs> so mostly when I was seeing holding companies, um, they were being used by like just hedge funds so that people could write off losses that their investments were incurring because it was really tax advantageous to them to being to being able to write off a bunch of losses. So that tends to be just an accounting question of like when and how do you want to pay your taxes? And also to some extent, where do you want to pay your taxes? I mean, when I was dealing with hedge funds, typically the holding companies are in like the Bahamas or something. So you stick a holding company there and all the profits end up offshore. So they it's basically paying nothing on those profits until you actually want to bring it back into Canada. So that's usually what holding companies get used for. It tends to be, um, yeah, a lot of tax considerations, at least from what I've dealt with, if that was what you were thinking of. If not, then I can answer a modified question. Awesome. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Again, you can pop in the chat. Um, and while we wait for those, I'll just go to the next slide. We do have some upcoming webinars. So tomorrow we actually have one on protecting your intellectual property. 
as well as on October 14th, we have Ask Me Anything Incorporating Your Business. Oh, and it looks like we got some more questions coming in. Um, so I'll jump on that first one there. Um, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So sole owner. Yep. That's um, totally how like the vast majority of small businesses work. Cause like there's a bunch of really great tax advantages to like do putting to making money as a company. You, it's a very, very small tax amount versus making it as a person. So yeah, you can form a corporation in like 30 minutes if it's not going to be particularly complicated. And um, yeah, you can be the only shareholder, the only director, the only officer, all you totally fine. Uh, yeah, you can start of signing things as a representative of the company. So the company is the one giving the services, the company is the one getting paid, the money is staying in the company. Uh, when you actually want that money, you can pay yourself as an employee a salary, but that's probably not going to be ideal. Or you can pay yourself dividends, which even though you're paying kind of twice on the money, the overall tax rate tends to still be advantageous. And you also get to choose when you want to pay yourself. So you can kind of mess around with when you want income to actually hit because you can just leave it in the company, which was initially taxed at a super low rate. So the company has a bunch of cash now. And if you don't want a bunch of extra income in a given year, then don't pay yourself in the company that you pay yourself next year or take a bunch of losses or get creative with it. A uh, little bit more of an accounting question there, but I mean, effectively, yeah, you're totally free to be a one person corporation. No issues there. Uh, how do I write it? Yeah. So as long as you're, is a personal service operation. Yeah, so essentially you're just doing everything as a, as a company. So the company's being taxed at the corporate rate, and then you can choose to pay yourself through a couple of different mechanisms. And generally that's pretty advantageous if, you're, if there's more than like 100K coming in. Okay, right, so I'll jump to this next one here. Uh, Co-founder is leaving a company that doesn't have a, uh, I mean, if the co-founder is happy just to sell their shares back, uh, I mean, that's fine. Uh, maybe they just want the money back that they put in, if the company could afford that, great. Uh, maybe they'll insist on having the value of the company assessed so they can get fair value for their shares. Um, so uh, for, we're talking about USA, for the people in the chat, that's a unanimous shareholder agreement. Um, you can kind of put whatever you want in there. Typically they provide a lot of shareholder protection. So you usually see them with small businesses and they usually make it really difficult to actually get rid of shares. <laughs> But uh, I mean, if all the shareholders are on the same page about being okay with the co-founder leaving, then it's probably gonna be easy just to, everyone will sign off saying, yep, we're okay. We'll pay this person X, company buys the shares back so they get redistributed. If everyone's in consent with what they want to happen, shouldn't be an issue. Uh, unanimous shareholder agreement is kind of the thing you see that puts a lot of restrictions in a small business context. So I mean, if there isn't one, I mean, <laughs> uh, the thing with small, uh, the thing with private issuers is it can be pretty hard to get rid of your shares, even if there's no restrictions. It's because you can't just sell them to the public. You might be able to sell them to an investor. Chances are there's kind of a basic rule about the board needing to sign off on a majority in order for someone else, to, on someone, on someone who's allowed to buy the shares, being able to buy them. But if everyone is okay with what's happening, there shouldn't be too much of a problem. Which is selling the shares to whoever wants them, if your co-founder wants to leave. Uh, there's, yep, yeah, no, it's just the chat thing at the bottom. All right, uh, if there's any further questions, if I didn't quite uh, latch on to what you were interested for that uh, USA thing, I can talk more about that. Otherwise, uh, yeah, the link is there. Awesome. Well, I mean, thank you so much, Nicholas. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did. Oh, it looks like we have another question from Brent. Okay, apparently I touched on it. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> um, sure. <okay. laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for uh, hosting and giving us this presentation. And I did put uh, Nicholas's profile. So if you guys do want to talk to him one on one, you can follow that link. And you can also use that 25% off. So September 25, pretty easy to remember. Um, and yeah, if there's no other questions, I guess we can close out. All right. Okay. Good chat with everyone. I'm going to go. Grab a snack. Yes. Thank you guys for showing up. We'll uh, see you again next time. Thank you.